Hey everyone, Ethan Billingsley. I'm a faculty member here at Colorado State University in the Human Dimensions of Natural Resources Department. And I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Andy Worth this morning. Um, before I begin, I just want to remind folks if you're new or if you've been on here, um, if you have questions or comments, you can put them in the chat of the Zoom. And so, yeah, if, uh, if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the Zoom. And uh, I'll go ahead and give Mr. Worth's intro right now. Andy Worth is an executive leader with global experience. His career includes building and funding startups, developing high performance teams and standing up and leading companies and organizations in a diverse set of industries and sectors. Uh, Mr. Worth's experience crosses from the private sector to NGOs and NPOs, and from local and state governments to the US federal government, and to sovereign nations in Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and North America. Most recently, Mr. Worth co-founded the Peak Ski Company, LLC, and the MBAR W Group with Bodie Miller, who many of you will probably recall, famed uh, Olympic skier, American skier. The Peak Ski Company is a global company headquartered in Bozeman, Montana. The company builds high performance and the most technologically advanced skis in the world for recreational skiers of all ability levels. Mr. Worth formerly served as Chief Executive Officer for global operating companies, including the 33.5 billion giga project, NEOM, located in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Squall Valley Alpine Meadows Ski Holdings, mm -hmm. Intra West ULC in Vancouver, Canada, and has helped build and lead companies engaged in risk and security management slash mitigation within austere environments outside the United States. Mr. Worth spent much of his early career working with various ski resort ownership groups, holding companies based out of Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Andy has always been very active in his communities and served on over 20 nonprofit boards of directors. Uh, Mr. Worth has also maintained a lifelong commitment and an action-oriented disposition relative to conservation and environmental issues. And perhaps most importantly, he is a fellow alum from Colorado State University from our Natural Resource Tourism Program. So, if Mr. Worth is online, we'll hand it over. I'm looking right now. Looks like we've got Andy. There we go. How are we doing? Can you hear me, Ethan? Yes, sure can. Thanks for Outstanding. joining. Outstanding. Welcome. Oh, heck yeah. I caught a bit of your introduction. Sorry, it was kind of a Pete Rose head first slide into uh, our offices here in Bozeman, Montana. We knew you'd be here. There you go. No, that's that's true. It's, it's good to see you, brother. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Good, good. Uh, audio good before I get zoom in here on um, audio good and video good and all. Everything sounds and looks good, especially that awesome background you got going on. I see your. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't try this at home. Pretty nifty, huh? <laughs> that is awesome. Good deal. Right, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Ethan. Thanks. And, and, and truly thanks to uh, Colorado State University, uh, Ethan and the team at the College of Natural Resources, and uh, certainly a good friend of mine, Michael Manfredo. And uh, as I've mentioned, I, I sure appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to speak to everybody. It's just one of the more challenging circumstances because I, I just love engaging in conversation with folks, but this kind of virtual circumstance that is real, uh, if you will, um, when virtual becomes real, uh, it, it's just challenging to not see folks and see your, your response or length, body language and more, but I'm just going to do my best. And, uh, if I, uh, make some missteps or something, Ethan, I hope you'll throw something at me through a virtual baseball at me and, or snowball. And, uh, but just, uh, we'll, we'll lock and load and get going here. Uh, but again, it's, it's a real honor, uh, to be speaking to everybody today. And, uh, Ethan, I'm sharing my screen. Please give me a thumbs up if that's working. Excellent. So uh, it's uh, I've had the opportunity, gosh, I think it was 2019 over in England uh, to visit with a, a group in person, certainly pre-COVID. And it was also an honor in that case. And, and uh, there's certain 
elements of my discussion today that harmonize with uh, that, but hopefully some of it's new. Uh, given that this is a very, very diverse audience, I hope you'll appreciate, I've, I've tried to offer up some thoughts, insights, if you will. I'd <laughs> hesitate to say it's inspiration, but maybe there's something in here uh, that comes from others uh, with, which I, with whom I've been associated. Uh, so we'll uh, get into that and just hope this fits and it works uh, for everybody, this diverse group. And towards the end, I, uh, you know, near and dear to my heart are, are the folks participating in this conference virtually that are students or thinking about jumping into this field. And you're going to hear, hear a great deal of encouragement and some thoughts on that, um, you know, regardless of field, private sector, public sector, uh, NGOs, MBOs, you name it. All of the acronyms. Um, I hope this I hope this resonates. So, uh, you know, before we get going, um, I think it's kind of what forms our perspective. And so we all understand this, and I'll, I'll talk about maybe the group, if you will. This I think fairly substantial global group. This group global group that's on the phone presently. Um, but with my background, it's it, it is just part of who I am, just like all of us, and just recognize that and. And, and hope you can appreciate, uh, I speak with pride uh, about my, my grandfather. My, my upbringing was uh, in the first 10, 10 or so years of my life in Germany and then Scotland, uh, where our family's from, and, and my beloved uh, uncle and, and others still reside, and I still get back there as much as I can. Um, and, and so that was kind of formative years, but, but the patriarch of our family, and there's a reason why I mentioned this, is Conrad Work, who's director of the National Park Service for 11 years. And uh, I, I mentioned this, and I'll expand on this, but all of us have our basis, what frames our point of view, and it comes from different sources. It can be music, it can be, gosh willing, the creek don't rise nowadays, it's politicians, who knows. Um, it can be uh, artists, it can be professors. Of course, it can be our faith, it can be so many different things. In my case, it was truly my grandfather. I, I grew up in a household where conservation in this case is expressed in, in the mission of the National Park Service was part of our family religion, for lack of a better phrase. It was truly part of the conversation at Thanksgiving dinners and the like. It was of substantial influence. And, and still, I'm proud to say, uh, uh, I think resides with me in, in many, and guides me in many ways. As I, uh, I would hesitate to say I matured, <laughs> as I grew up, I, uh, I did choose to in essence, start to follow in, in my grandfather's footsteps and very prideful in telling you that I got my uh, federal law enforcement certification and more uh, EMTI and, and became a backcountry ranger in Rocky Mountain National Park and just enjoyed the heck out of that and still do love that area. And uh, that was kind of a very real expression of everything I just mentioned. And that that's a really important framing of things. Um, you know, there's, there's those who can and those who do and, and those who act and in this case, I'm just nothing but prideful of being associated with the National Park Service and the team with which I worked as backcountry rangers on the North Fork of the Big Thompson up there in Rocky Mountain National Park. But it was something that was my job. It was also who I was. It remains with me to this day. Not unlike that, uh, frankly, to, to be able to afford, for co afford college, um, I, I needed to switch gears a little bit, make a bit more money. And I chose to do that through fighting wildland fire. And I did that in what's called in, in U.S. terms, uh, type one crew and initial attack crew, um, typically kind of called hotshot crews. And I did that, did that out of northern New Mexico. Gosh darn it, I enjoyed the heck out of that. Uh, different kind of work in, in, in the, uh, in, in the backcountry and, and more. Um, you know, it's, it's the Santa Fe hotshot, the crew, our motto was, uh, if you do it for fun, you're a pyromaniac. If you do it for money, you're an arsonist. If you do it for both, you're a hotshot. I hope you can appreciate, uh, we did it for the love, we did it for the money, and both. And in my case, it was to be able to pay for my, my great education at Colorado State University, go Rams, very prideful in that, as, as Ethan, I, say, I think, has acknowledged, and Mr. Manfred, Professor Manfredo and Dr. Manfredo know, um, I'm, I'm very proudly a Ram and uh, still uh, think fondly about my time there and the continued influence, uh, the influence that continues today uh, that that I was yielded uh, from some of the professors and some of the programs I, I took there. So you bundle all that together, that was kind of the start and the framing of my, my point of view of many things. Um, I hope that makes sense. If 
uh, to everybody, a kind of calibration point. I took a, a turn and ended up going into private sector. I was on my way to grad school and ended up quite by accident in, uh, in the ski resort business. For me, it was a perfect convergence of uh, working and living and passion for living and working in the mountains, but at the same time, a, a career didn't necessarily having me work 10, 16 hour shift on a fire in northeastern Arizona, so to speak, for the for the kind of the parts, main parts of my life. And, and direct, developed this career, and it just worked out great. Um, I've had the pleasure and honor of, of working primarily based out of Steamboat Springs, Colorado, not too far from Fort Collins. Uh, worked with different holding groups. I, I moved fairly uh, early in my career into the strategic realm, transactional realm. And, and yes, yeah, I finished off my career kind of working in private equity and more. Um, so if I start to sound like a lawyer or a banker, there's, there's a reason for that. Um, but at the same time, I, I'm prideful in that I had that career and then worked out of Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And um, and that also informs one of my last slides and discussion points on private sector. Obviously, by way of uh, working for the Park Service in my upbringing, kind of raised in the public sector, sector uh, worked in the public sector, moving to the private sector in this form through ski resorts. I had the opportunity to work with 20 resorts in North America in some total through different holding companies, um, I, you know, based in uh, Vancouver, Canada, but then also Steamboat Springs. Then good fortune, good fortune struck, and I was able to retire in 2017, which is a good friend of mine. More on him later. Uh, Bodie Miller said uh, he's my business partner down there in the lower right part of the slide. The a ski racer, a retired ski racer. He said, as a good friend, because that's not going to last long. You're going to think at that. And he was right. I had, uh, gosh, I don't know, three months into it. And I sure hope you all can figure it out on this on this call. If you get to that point kind of early, um, I wasn't very good at it. I threw myself into nonprofits and, and the like. But, oh, gosh, cliches like gas in the tank, you name it. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe like some famous athletes, but not famous here, uh, came out of retirement and got back into a whole bunch of called more fun projects. And most recently, uh, uh, ended up working with a couple of companies and startups uh, with, with Bodie, who's a very, Bodie Miller, very dear friend and business partner with Peaks Gump, Ski Company and also MBRW Group, a consulting firm we have that takes on a number of different forms. I sure should mention that through my career in between Ski Resort and now, I've had the opportunity to do a great deal of work in China, particularly within the ski resort world prior to the Winter Games. I uh, worked with uh, Genting Sacred Gardens, quite a few trips over there and work over there in the business environment uh, up near Chongli. Uh, and so fair amount of experience in, in that theater or that area of operation. And also, uh, gosh, it was about two and a half years ago, worked over in Saudi Arabia on a couple of different projects. And so, uh, you know, it, I, I think it'd be reasonable to say that I'm well-traveled, um, a bit of experience uh, outside of just North America. Um, that also frames my point of view and, and thankfully, hopefully makes this a bit relevant for those who aren't necessarily from North America. Good to go. Um, so then now I've got to shift gears here. Uh, I'm going to do my best to isolate. Please appreciate, I'm sure most folks on this call have been speakers. Um, done this. There is, a, I think, an important item for me. It's more easily done in presentations in kind of more typical settings rather than virtual. And that is a sense of calibration. That's a sense of shared interests and thinking and passions and work. I have zero doubt that there's a real diverse group uh, that's participating in today's program. But I would also be really uh, believing that there's a lot, there's a real commonality and there's come at difference in background and points of view, but at the same time, passions that we share and, and more. And, and I would suggest it's likely, because kind of by, by default, you're participating in the Tourism Naturally program today. So probably likely that you're interested in uh, natural and protected areas and landscapes, and that's somehow important to you personally or your career or your academic work. Um, and, and then I would hope and trust, if not try and feed, if it doesn't exist, uh, the motivation that, that originates uh, uh, for your chosen path and, and participating in today, that there's something more profound than financial reward or station, meaning title, or your ego. Certainly everybody has that. It's just a question of 
of the gradient of pride and ego, but I, I trust that there's something more intrinsic and deep inside your DNA. And bluntly, I'm counting on it for some of the dis discussion points. Um, the, the other thing I want to make, make sure I recognizing, again, I'm trying to put this in global terms is remarkably challenging, but it's likely that there, uh, the nature of threats or barriers to entry or barriers to advancing programs or initiatives or funding you're seeking for things, um, that there's, there's actually commonality, regardless of the form of government, regardless of the nature and circumstance in which you find yourself. And, and that's, that's probably the case. Could be academic, uh, could be other environments. Um, so just quickly recognize that. And, and then I'm, I'm gonna go straight to things. I promised uh, Dr. Manfredo that I wouldn't get political um, and I won't, uh, but I will go straight at the core of something that I think is supremely way above politics and that we all fully appreciate and are fully well read into the exigent threat and the real immediate threat that climate change represents to our planet and our society. And I just hit quickly on this. And, and that is times when I worked in the ski resort business, I'd give presentations and discussions to great groups like the Sierra Club. I've been a member since I was 13. And, and the discussion was because I'm the CEO of, of various ski resorts and holding companies, aren't you worried about the threat that climate change represents to the ski resort business? And, and my response was no. And I'd wait for that pregnant, weird, awkward, silent pause to go out of uh, a little, few more awkward moments than it probably should have. And say, because that's completely underestimating, understating the nature of this threat. This is a threat to society. This is not a threat to a sector. Um, and, and so I'll not overstate, uh, I'll not spend a lot of time on this, but I trust that all of us are calibrated on that because um, that plays into virtually everything we do uh, as we advance, including protecting. And yes, if you've read ahead, just try and add a little bit of levity to things. Um, you know, I, I hope we'd, we'd all agree that Kanye, uh, otherwise known as Ye, is, is a bit of a lunatic. Um, uh, and, and also, uh, this is for my friends in Great Britain, uh, up in Derby and at Buxton, it probably a little bit too much read into Prince Harry's and Meghan Markle's social, last social media post. Maybe we don't all agree on that, but uh, now, uh, Ethan, I, I bet you some folks are going on social media right now to check to see what the last posting was for, for those guys. Um, I hope that that's a, a, a shared, couldn't call it a shared value, but let's call it maybe a, a shared point of view on uh, relative importance. So now diving into uh, something, uh, this is, this is it's, it's, oh, there's, sorry, an intrigued theory in that moment. Um, in, in, this, in this case, this is, uh, as they say, personal, but it's not. It's meant to shape a point. And, and please do me a favor and, and, and suspend the current uh, circumstances, your social media feed, what you've seen this morning on television news, you name it. And if you will, join me and go back to the 50s and 60s. And, and uh, speaking to my, my grandfather, Conrad Wirth, and, and it's got kind an of interesting inside ball here, inside stories here I'd share with you. He served as the director of National Park Service between 1951 and 1964. Um, and, and he did it for passion, career, and more. And, and I think one could suggest all the right reasons. But when, when you consider the Forget conservation, forget what he did, just consider the era of that time frame of 1951 to 1964. I did not appreciate this point until later on in my life. I'm, I will acknowledge, I can't say embarrassed, but he was. Some of the times I'd argue with him about national parks and, and how they should be substantially more preservation oriented and more, uh, I, I look back at that not worth a regret, but gosh darn it, I was a little bit young and immature and maybe I could have done a better job listening, but I guarantee you, I heard him. Um, and, and so going back to this point, which suggests uh, kind of how things are today and the challenges, the barriers, put yourself in the 50s and the 60s when you consider the Korean War, the post-World War II, and then recovery of, from Korea. Uh, there was an extended recession because simultaneously President Eisenhower developed the interstate system. Uh, there was basically mass production of automobiles. Travel is cheap. Gas was on a relative basis cheap. Um, and uh, God, there was there's been an interesting era in at least the U.S. And, and then when we think about the mores of the society, this is, I think, critical. In the 50s and 60s, um, thank you for entertaining my colloquial uh, resolution of these three bullet points of preservation, huh? Conservation, why? And protected areas, what the heck for? 
and and that's probably not too far from a real truth summary of 80x percent of Americans consider that John Muir was kind of still considered a little bit of a lunatic Scotsman who did stuff out in the Sierras in the 50s and 60s. And then Aldo Leopold, one of the great conservation minds in this era, in Thin County Almanac, uh, still one of the books that I treasure and hold dear and, and still read to, to remind myself of what's important. That was that's brand new. And it wasn't necessarily outlandish, but it definitely wasn't um, kind of on, on folks' minds. Preservation, conservation, protected areas, it was substantially more about harvesting, yielding, reaping, and, and that has a role and purpose, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, mores, the generally accepted beliefs of society in the U.S. in that era, didn't necessarily carry this, this heavy. As a, when we quoted as saying the, 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 the environmental ethic that exists today with, with paint being applied to the conscious of Americans in this case, and it was still very, very much drying. Um, and, so, and so it's pretty important to understand that. Uh, that created a circumstance for my grandfather. And, uh, and, and of course, I'm summarizing a, a career, so it's almost impossible, but I, I offer these up. Um, I'm not sure if he developed this. This is kind of uh, Al Gore did not develop the Internet. I, certainly everybody recognizes that. But at the same time, I, I believe my grandfather developed this thought coming out of the 50s with Americans traveling in their cars and vehicles, interstate system, ease of access time. And despite the recession going on, it, it would travel in and national parks were being loved to death in our country. He developed a very bold and a very aggressive initiative that was called Mission 66. Now, many, for instance, at the Colorado State College of Natural Resources um, are maybe aware of this, um, maybe not. But that, that, that initiative that has, a, if you will, a trade name was really important. Because Americans were loving the national parks. And in this case, my grandfather, my gramps, had this perspective of we're loving them to death. And what we do what we do is still provide access. Oh, it looks like I'm freezing. Am I good at Ethan? Good. Um, that Americans were, were loving the parks to death because of ease of access. And they were just trammeled, basically. And the converse, combination of still allowing, I'll never forget his words, allowing Americans to still explore, see, enjoy their lands. Emphasis on their lands. There's the National Park Service and other governmental entities uh, like USDA and Forest Service are stewards, but at the same time, they're in this case, they're the, the lands that are owned by the, the Americans, in this case, in the public. Wanted to facilitate that, but at the same time, not have them be ruined. This this program was was bold. It was a 10-year-long program. I did this calculation. It's accurate on, on accounting for uh, the net present value of $1 billion from 1960 to $11 billion today. 10-year, um, $11 billion program um, was developed. And, and I'll go through that a little bit more. But it basically was to harden the landscape, to create better lodging and or housing for the people that work there at the national parks to care for them. And, and it was a detailed program. And I can assure you, promise you, it was not smooth running, running for him. And, and more on that in a second. And why was it not smooth running for him? To, to develop that initiative, to develop the plans in a thoughtful fashion and that because of the era. Because preservation and conservation were question marks more than anything else. Why do we need to do this? A little bit more of an extract, extractive mode, if you will. Um, same time he developed Mission 66, secured the funding from the US federal government. He also negotiated a pro, uh, uh, basically a land uh, acquisition with uh, Lawrence Rockefeller III, uh, creating what we know now today is Grand Teton National Park and St. John National Park. Again, pretty remarkable things in and of themselves. He's in, how am I doing? Good. So I, I put this now into a little bit more, uh, again, uh, I said at the beginning, offering up maybe some insights, trying to make them broad enough for everybody. But in case you're wondering and saying, well, gosh, it was different then. I would submit it was. It was materially more challenging. When you consider the, the broad societal trends in the absence of an e environmental e ethic and ethos, in the 50s and 60s, 
When you consider the headwinds of the economic conditions and the constant and unrelenting political battles for funding, it's a real deal. Now, sure, the social media wasn't didn't exist by far. And things, the weaponization, the bifurcation, and uh, polarization, you name it, that doesn't. But I can guarantee you, the same things that we're feeling, seeing is whether you're working for a nonprofit, a non-governmental organization, a, a regulatory agency for the U.S. federal government, a state agency, in the academic realm, there was still proxies. There was still a replication of that, in some cases in a bigger, more challenging form. Um, and in this case, and, and by the way, he, he put together this book called I Smile and I Laugh because Parks, Politics, and the People is a book he wrote. Um, of course, in our family, it's a big deal. Um, but I can tell you, it's it's not exactly it, it's kind of dry reading. So, but it it documents his career and his thinking and inputs. I still contend that parts of it apply today, and and uh, that which is new actually refers to the old, and, and it can be a useful uh, line of thinking for many of you. And and I'm not promoting the book; it's more just it's all there. Um, and so this is a combination of me sitting with him at Thanksgiving with a stealing away with smoking a cigar that he gave me at the age of 13 and, and just talking about this and just doing nothing but drifting in conversation. So much of this originates from that and some of it's also informed by this, this really wonderful book he put together that uh, if you will codifies and memorializes key parts of his career. Impact point for everybody. And this can be personal, professional, I submit in almost every form. Um, Hit pause. When, when I was working in Rocky Mountain National Park, I did a whole, whole lot of high angle rescue. And of course, whether it be on a red, uh, on Long's Peak on the Diamond, uh, you know, some hairball stuff, or on a ladder, what's the number one thing you don't tell folks? Uh, don't, don't look down. But what do they do? They look down. So if you say, be resilient, you, you know, you kind of get this, uh, what do you mean? How do I be, you know, kind of crazy either confusion or, or something opposite of a desired effect. So I, I do appreciate that this is a catchphrase, a word, a consultant type way to put things. But Gramps, Conrad Worth, single most important, and I would argue applicable and adoptable trait was resilience. And for my career, I can tell you public sector, private sector, in between sector, nonprofits, and you name it. Um, I do believe and I, this is a learned belief, a learned line of thought, that it's a choice that individuals make, that individual leaders make. Um, and it's also a trait of high performance organizations, whether it be the USFS, the US Forest Service, US National Park Service, a nonprofit, a non governmental organization, a private sector group, you name it. But it is a trait that almost always exists in all organizations. My good friends and some of the other work I do in the special warfare community of the government and other businesses that I have to, to even today, um, this concept of resilience is, is a really profound item. There's, if you Google it, there are so many great books. Admiral McRaven, who's a friend of mine, he did a great, he has, speaks so well on resilience and he was uh, head of Naval Special Warfare for the US Navy. Uh, and, and he's got some great learnings and thinking that I, I submit can, can be adopted and uh, put in play in everybody's life, if you will, in their career. And, and, and that is actually, as I look back in those conversations from the, the, you know, the 13 year old trying to deal with a cigar with talking with my grandfather and be inspired, but at the same time still, come back to this in a second, argue with him about preservation versus conservation. Um, from those moments to today, I look back and say, if I had to choose that one word, like it said in that movie, City Slickers, there's that one thing, it's resilience. Now, he didn't read the book. He didn't watch the movie. didn't watch talk to a consultant. He didn't have McKinsey talk to him about this. It was something that was either intrinsic, learned, developed over time. He also had his people who inspired him and drove him and you name it. But that is, that is, is something that will serve you no matter what is before you. When times are great still need it. Things are medium difficult, you need it. And of course, when things are challenging, we all need it. And, and this fundamentally circles back to the work that we all, and, the, and the, basically the, the principles, the values, the mores we all share um, and, and the things that we seek to do with 
natural tourism naturally and working with protected areas, again, regardless of your sector in which you work. Of the things, uh, kind of how that expresses itself, I do know this. He, he listened. He was an astute listener. He always listened. He was a strong collaborator. I'm not even sure that word was, I know it existed, of course, but I'm not too sure it was kind of in vogue back then. But he always acted. Because listening creates an off-ramp uh, for folks instead of acting. Collaboration can create, you know, kind of what happens when you get 12 people to go in to design a horse that comes out of camp. And that can be one of the adverse, negative, not great expressions of collaboration. But the acting and advancing is something that was one of the things that he did and, and I strive to do in my work. And I, I offer it up for you to consider. Um, again, everybody's got the processes. And, and this, is, this is, granted, this was put in a, in a phrase that I hope it doesn't offend anybody, but certainly um, don't fear engagements. Don't fear battles. Don't, just, there's nothing gained by that. If you believe, if, if you consider yourself resilient, if you could be resilient, you have to advance. And it's kind of called that euphemistically a cliche, a battle. We've got to be prepared. It doesn't take away the need for work study, understanding, in this case, is presented prior, listening, collaborating, prepare. I would submit, always choose to seek to choose the right battles. This is where self-deprecating, I can do this all day long on my career and my field. I've, I've chose, chosen incorrect battles in my career. Uh, major ski resorts that I've been responsible, for which I've been responsible. And I look back and say, gosh darn it, I wish I had hit pause and thought, been a little more thoughtful about that. But always engage, always engage. And this is something that Gramps did in the face of what was, in retrospect, irrational opposition. He still advanced. In this case, he was advancing with something I think most of us would consider as noble. And that is the betterment, the protection of the public lands that were being loved to death. And it was something honorable, something had value. Oh, by the way, it was what he was supposed to do. It was his job. He was empowered with that position an incredible responsibility, um, but he chose to advance. And yeah, there was tons of opposition societally, in the political realm of that, you can be assured that is in fact captured in, in his book. Um, and, and we all have to recognize from China to Great Britain, to Italy, to the US, and many of the countries that I'm not speaking to, uh, those who are represented on this call, uh, we stand on the shoulders of those who chose to advance and chose to take on some uh, level of, of engagement in, in some traits along these lines. I hope that makes sense. And I sure hope that it doesn't come across at all as, as pedantic or at all uh, uh, kind of lecturing. Uh, so uh, here I am using the word lecture in kind of an academic environment, if you will. Um, so I, I think, uh, let me bring it to today. And Andy, the, let me just um, time. We we probably got yeah minutes and maybe wrap it up here. Well, that's good because I'm a slide away. Perfect. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, it it is of note, and and we have the global pandemic creating an overdrive demand for all things outdoors, gear, clothing, outstripped on demand to supply, and we are in fact with the national parks in the U.S. right back to loving our parks to death. And, and really substantial measures going in place to try and drive that. However, we have an environmental ethic throughout. And in, in my case, now I turn it back into my career in the private sector, um, I, I strongly submit it's all about the approach, the intrinsic belief. And, and the reason I say this is because I, I did work with 36 CFR as a backcountry ranger and protecting the environment with that code of federal regulations. And, and so I think about EPA, you name it, Compliance starts the conversation. In this case, it's our beliefs that advance and, and actually the self-ascribed standards that carry forward the actions. And, and that's really critical. And so we think about that. Sure, consumer demand, you know, we've seen all that kind of stuff. It, it's really not about that. I submit for everybody on the phone, somehow, some way, doing something more than putting a bumper sticker on your car. This is where I'm going to get a little bit assertive. Something more than putting a bumper sticker on your car. What you do today in your career, no matter what your environment, no matter who you're influencing, what's the generation from now? From now, what are folks going to say about you, your tenure, your leadership, and your team? 
That is a question only you can answer. Resilience is a choice that folks make. It's a, tro it's a choice that leaders make. And to build it and develop it into organizations in your daily life is, is, is I, I would submit something that will aid you in, in, in basically engaging in this discussion. So, um, you know, as I close out, by the way, this is my house, my little ranch out west of Bozeman, Montana, this morning at 7.35 a.m. Mountain Time. Um, you know, this is uh, hopefully a, a base case for modeling for all of us financial engineers in terms of um, what happens with tourism in protected areas, um, how important it is to us. That drops out of the environmental ethic that, that comes uh, from today's mores. Uh, but I also hope reaching back to the 50s and 60s um, has some value to you all in, in taking those lessons. Uh, you know, I'm not going to use too many cliches of what is old and what is is now new and still applicable or some iterations. I screwed that one up, didn't I, Ethan? Um, I just tell you that I, I think there are still lessons that hold true. The words of John Muir are not accidentally down in the lower left in the words of Robert Frost. Uh, most of us have chosen a different path. And that's made all the difference. And, and Muir's words still hold true to this day, as do I think the lessons learned from my grandfather's work. I came out of retirement, worked with a very dear friend of mine up here in Montana. We make really great skis. We have this consulting company. I just, I really appreciate the time. And again, I'll, I'll close out with proud to be a CSU Ram. Ethan, Professor Man, Dr. Manfredo, I really appreciate you guys. Tremendous honor to address this group. Thank you, Andy, so much for sharing. And it's you know, resilience is certainly an in vogue uh, term and an idea right now. I feel like I feel like I hear a lot about it recently. It's cool to hear that uh, Conrad was hip to this decades ago, right? And um, that'll be the first time somebody said hip to this in conjunction <laughs> with my grandfather. <laughs> but I get your point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think if we can, we might have just one question uh, I'd like to pose to you. Um, yeah. The risk of running over a few minutes, but I, I had a question um, sp specific to ski resorts, and here, here it goes. I'll read it to you. While many ski resorts are threatened by rising temperatures and uncertain snowfall, it seems that climate change may actually lead to new viable sites for ski resort development in certain parts of the world. Can you think of any specific examples of major ski resort companies currently developing new resorts in areas that stand to benefit from climate change? No, this, yeah. no, I, I just, I, I can't, I, I do appreciate, by the way, it's a thoughtful question. Mm -hmm. I, mean, it's, I, I was posing, it's a thoughtful question. Um, I go back into my transactional hat and I'll try and keep this brief and segment my, my answer into three components. But honestly, just this, the, I hear the phrase climate change and it's, it's one of the things that erases my brain. I just can't ascribe anything positive to it other than we're probably 30 days late, 30 years late on, on actually taking it seriously. That aside, a friend of mine, Von Schenard, has we're both kind of of this mindset of we might be too late, but we're still in the fight. Um, with that said, I can't, uh, I just can't buy off on that. Uh, number one, advancements in technology and the resilience of ski resort operating companies is very much at hand. Advancements in technology. I was working in, in Northwest Saudi Arabia about two and a half years. We were actually looking at, uh, I, I would submit, in retrospect, it was irresponsible, but we were looking at making snow at a high mountain desert in Northwest Saudi Arabia. The technology that exists today to make snow when ambient temperatures don't make any sense, it's there and it continues to improve. And what exists today on regular snowmaking systems is 40 to 60% more efficient uh, than it was say five or six years ago. Techno Alpin, Denver-based co uh, company, um, you know, the technology is still allowing uh, companies to to be in a very solid position, even with uh, the bio, the violent whip saw nature of ambient temperatures, humidity, and, and natural snow, and then the resilience of the operating company models. This is where I'm going to sound a little bit more like a kind of a CEO, private equity guy. Um, the the ability on capital structure and where it was where what's invested, um, you know, it's it it's still a, a profitable business, probably will be a profitable business for quite a while because you have smart folks with advancing with great technology uh, at hand, and then also the ability to adapt business models. So I think to to drive below the the kind of uh, chicken little type headlines is is that's where you see it. And bluntly, if you don't agree with me, and that's fine, 
I respect that. Uh, look at the market capitalization, the market cap of these companies. Bill Resorts sold publicly, doing pretty well. Um, and, and, and that's one of the, the key measures of success. Lastly, the barriers to entry for building a new resort are and should be really substantial. And, and there might be a spot. There might be more spots opened up for one reason. And this is work that I did with uh, Dr. Noah Diffenbaugh, who heads up the Earth Sciences Department at Stanford and in California. Um, I came to understand climate change and came to understand the methodology, actually the, the true tools that are used to measure this. And climate change is real, of course, but it also what it brings about or it is, is really essential to understand. And this is where there could be uh, value in this. And that is the, the whipsaw, the volatility of weather patterns is what's at hand. And, and uh, global warming, yes, but hemispherically and even regionally, you have uh, a whipsaw of, of, you know, one year where you're getting a, a ski resort that might've had 750 uh, inches of snow annually, average annual snowfall. It gets one year, it gets 1,250 inches and the next year it gets 100. And, and that increased frequency of, of that, uh, you know, deviation, if you will. So that might create that, but I submit it's more the, the resiliency and the capital structure of the companies. And then going back or backwards to my first point, uh, more so associated with uh, the, the technology development on enhancements of things like snowmaking, which, which by the way, we extended snowmaking or ski seasons in the late eighties. It's, it is inaccurate. It's fundamentally inaccurate to think that global climate change, which is exceedingly real and a threat is shrinking seasons. We actually artificially literally artificially lengthened them both front and back end by snowmaking in the late eighties. It's true. It's, it's that simple. So they're shrinking, sure, but not, uh, there's other causative factors. Uh, mostly when you look at the reference point of when we lengthen them. Uh, yeah. So there you go. Sorry, Ethan. So I did my best. So that's yeah. Point. Your mm-hmm. insight on that is all really uh, just lovely to hear. And we appreciate your time and energy so much. Um, look forward to uh, to seeing you soon, but I look forward to seeing those peak skis shredding the slopes this season. The, so, there you go. <laughs> right on. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy that new snow in Montana, and we'll we'll talk to you soon. Ethan and the team there, Colorado State. Thanks so much. It's an honor. Thank you very very much.